the coronavirus replication cycle. So now we have translated our entire genome so the genome of a picornavirus usually just has one gigantic gene, which is that polyprotein gene. And different picornaviruses will have these components in different orders, but um, the big difference is that the P1 region, which contains the four proteins that make the virion, it can either be at the front or at the back, or it can be separate to the front and back, like um, with a little space in between and a second IRES, or it can sometimes even be on a second segment. So there are some uh, picornaviridae uh, that have uh, two segments to their genome, kind of like a miniature version of what flu was trying to do. Um, so the next big thing that happens is that we're going to take that polyprotein, and so this is the full-length protein we've translated that just has everything. It has one of everything the virus needs, and we're going. We've translated it, and we're then cut it. And so it first gets cut into three regions, region 1, region 2, and region 3. And so these are called the P1 region, P2, and P3, protein 1, protein 2, protein 3. And the, these different regions have different functions. So the P1 region is going to be involved in making virions only. That is its thing. And uh, that works because it has the VP4 and the VP2 and the VP3 and the VP1. So that's why that makes sense. The um, region 2 consists of a bunch of factors that seem to help the virus and or hurt the cell. So you've got that 2A protease. This is the thing that is going to break factor 4G, uh, EIF4G, uh, the part of the ribosome we just talked about. You've got 2B that's going to help uh, make virus factories, and uh, I believe it's a viroporin, but we've got that coming up. And you've got 2C, which is a helicase-like enzyme that doesn't seem to have helicase activity. We think this may be the RNA loader for picornaviruses. We think it may just set up at the, um, make an empty little shell, empty little capsid, and then it sort of feeds the RNA through and uh, packages it up inside of the virion. So this is the thought. Uh, it has not yet been demonstrated, but uh, hopefully somebody good will uh, get on this because a lot of people, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence pointing to this, but uh, no direct evidence yet. Um, and then down here you have the P3 region. P3 is all the really important stuff. Uh, so this is like um, uh, like that second region of the coronavirus or like the, uh, uh, the propol region of the um, HIV. And so we've got here, we've got, let's see, 3A, which is a neat little protein. I'll show you what that does in a minute. 3B is actually the VPG protein. So that's where VPG comes from. We make it as part of the polyprotein. And then we're going to end up with this attached to every single genome. And then over here we have the 3C. 3C is the main protease. And so 3C cuts everywhere with a little pink triangle, which you can see is pretty much everywhere. Um, there's this one other one up here. This is actually done by a protease inside the cell. But uh, other than that, uh, yeah, it does seem to be uh, 3C that is doing nearly everything. So 3C, think of the C as standing for cuts. And uh, 3D, the fourth part of uh, the P3 region, is the polymerase. So it is an RNA dependent, it reads RNA. RNA polymerase writes RNA. RNA dependent, RNA polymerase reads and writes RNA. Yeah. So this tells you that the coronaviruses have an RNA stage and they do not have any DNA stage. They don't uh, reverse transcribe or anything crazy like that. And here we go. Okay. If you were to line up a whole bunch of different proteases, this is what you would see. So, uh, or rather, a whole bunch of different uh, picornavirus polyproteins. So these are a bunch that all have the um, capsid at the beginning, and so all the capsid proteins are up here in these sort of blue colors. There's actually two blues here that are really similar on the screen. Um, in the middle, we've got our P2 region, so this is what's going to be involved in cell takeover and uh, maybe RNA loading. And then down here, we have the P3 region. You can see that tiny little VPG. It's just a little orange thing, uh, sliver in there. That's what's going to end up on the front of the genome. And we've got the 3C protease, and that's always next to the 3D polymerase. And think of the 3D polymerase as like a 3D printer for RNA. So that's how I remember it anyway. Um, but you've got, uh, yeah, uh, everything from uh, sort of 2B up to 3A. 
is going to be involved in membrane modification and or nucleotide binding. So by membrane modification, uh, I mean that this virus is going to do a lot of similar things uh, to the inside of a cell, uh, similar to what we saw with um, the coronavirus. Oh my gosh, yeah. Why did that drop out of my mind? <laughs> okay, so... Now we're going to go through each of the proteins one at a time. We're going to start out with the P1 region and look at the function of each of these proteins. And that's going to be the end of this particular section. Then we're going to move over to the uh, P2 region and P3 region. That's going to be in the next section of the presentation. So the P1 region, you've got your VP1, VP2, VP3, and VP4. Now VP1 and 2 and 3 all share a common protein fold. And that fold is called a beta jelly roll fold. And so this is going to consist of eight little strands that are bent around each other, like a barrel that somebody stepped on. That's what a beta jelly roll uh, looks like. Um, and the, the buh, 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 those form a nice little shell around the outside, and that's going to protect the RNA genome on the inside. So VP2 and 3 are just like the bricks that link into each other, and uh, 2 and 3 are going to come down here, and they're going to form a... It's an axis of three-fold symmetry. It looks like six-fold symmetry, but remember, that's a 3, that's a 2, that's a 3, that's a 2. So 2 and 3 are not quite identical. They're just real similar and uh, descended from a common ancestor, as is VP1. There are viruses like the norovirus that, you, instead of using a VP1 and 2 and 3... They just use one protein, and it does the job of all three of those proteins. And you know what? It works really well. <laughs> um, VP4, then, is the plug. So VP4, or you can say VP4 is the door. Yeah. One starts the fun, and four is the door. And so this is the plug. And so here we are looking. The outside of the virus is here, and so it's docked onto the cell. VP1 is the one that actually binds the receptor. And um, uh, the VPG is going to be docked at one of these VP1 uh, undersides, and it's going to be docked at the VP4. And so when the VP4 is uh, pulled across like this, it's, the door is basically shut. And then when the VP4 is uh, activated, it's going to move out of the way, boom, boom, and it's actually the tail end of VP1 that wraps all the way around. So it was the VP1 that was holding on to VPG and the genome, and it's actually going to get pulled through so that these little ends here at the end are going to get pulled right into the cell like that, and they're going to drop off the um, uh, the VPG, and from there, uh, once the virus uh, RNA is a little bit inside, it actually just gets pulled further and further and further inside, and uh, so yeah, the cell just <laughs> pulls this uh, virus in. It's probably proteins like, uh, or uh, structures like a ribosome that would pull it in. Because uh, when a ribosome runs into RNA, they just start frantically pulling on it uh, and trying to translate it right away. And Because, uh, yeah, cell doesn't mess around, cell doesn't wait around. Okay, so we're going to go through the uh, mechanism a little bit more in a minute. But uh, here's VP4, which is like our little door, or our little plug at the back. And uh, VP4 is just getting in the way. And then when we activate, we're going to move VP4 sort of up and out so that we can pull the rest of this through. So VP1 is going to operate sort of like a uh, switchblade. It's going to have a thing just like a fusion peptide. That's this little coil shown down here. And that's going to be tucked away inside the protein. When it binds the receptor, we're going to go from one metastable state to another, so we're going to stick out that fusion peptide equivalent. And this fusion peptide is going to insert into the cells. Um, and so now the virus is attached to the cell. But of course, since this is just a protein-only shell, we don't have to actually fuse two membranes. We just have to punch a hole in one membrane. And so uh, first, the uh, fusion peptide goes in, and then it pulls the rest of the protein in. So the rest of VP1 gets pulled down and it actually forms a little channel in the membrane. So VP1 makes its own pore in the membrane. And uh, when VP4 gets out of the way, the inner little tails of VP1 will pull the uh, start of the genome out into the cytoplasm and uh, drop it off there so it can start to be translated. So here you can see the different proteins. So uh, green fluorescent protein down here is a beta barrel. So it's a uh, cylinder-shaped protein 
made out of little beta strands that are all wrapped around each other, kind of like a basket. Uh, if you're looking at it from the end, it kind of looks like a can of Coke, uh, sort of like that. Um, here's VP1 and VP2 and VP3. The yellow and red parts are going to be the same in each one. So these are the beta jelly roll that we can see in yellow and red. And you can see that each one of these has a couple extra little alpha helices that are off at the side of the beta jelly roll. And each one has an extra bit that's either like a floppy loop or has a little beta sheet in it or that has a little helix in it. But otherwise, pretty similar proteins. Um, except for this little blue bit up here, which is the bit that actually sticks out and is going to make contact with the receptor. So very similar proteins, uh, VP1 and 2 and 3. And they just all lock together. And so they're probably the result from a single ancestral gene that was duplicated twice uh, to make three copies of the same gene. And more distantly related viruses like Khaleesi viruses and like norovirus um, will uh, just use three times as many copies of a single beta jelly roll, um, or sometimes they'll have a double beta jelly roll, and so they'll use, I don't know, two-thirds as many copies, <laughs> something like that, uh, as you get for um, uh, picornavirus. But it works. It makes the same structure, and it's fine. So here is VP1. This is a little of how VP1 works. And so uh, first, VP1 is going to bind to a receptor. Then it's going to be pulled into the endosome. So think clathrin coated pit, even though we remember there are other ways you can get into an endosome. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, clathrin, it can be whatever, caviolin or a number of other things. Um, and then the pH is going to drop and the H plus is going to increase. And you know what? There are going to be some histidines along there and they're going to get protonated. And then when they get protonated, they're going to change shape. And they're going to change the conformation of the protein once again. And uh, so when that happens, uh, each VP1 is actually going to end up extending. And it's going to extend a part that is very hydrophobic, or at least amphipathic at first. Uh, amphipathic helix It's going to bury itself halfway into the membrane. And then once that is buried, then uh, so here we've got uh, amphipathic helix coming out and burying the hydrophobic side into the membrane just like that. Then the other end of VP1. So this is the uh, C terminus of VP1. Here's the N terminus of VP1. It is going to come out uh, of the hole and uh, drag VP4 with it and drag the um, RNA uh, out. So VP1 and VP4 come out and the RNA comes out with them because they're holding on to the tail. Uh, they're holding on to the VPG that is on the genome. That's the idea there. All right, so that's the end of that one.